Hello everybody, this is a new video tutorial and it's all about Cinema 4D R13 and it's completely on this new physical renderer feature coming together with uh, the version 13 of Cinema 4D. So I would like to show you some new features this physical renderer offers and you might have seen some videos before on the physical renderer mostly considering and concerning with the um, motion blur and depth of field feature but I would like to show you how just to you know optimize render speed and what you can do with the physical render together with um, the physical sky and what special render mode you make can make use of but let's see so first of all this is just a simple scene it's my national gallery in Berlin model it's a front perspective and is there's no light sources and the renderer is set to standard so when I hit command R for rendering you can see that th this looks rather simple no light source no global illumination nothing okay so first of all let's change our physical uh, or standard renderer I'm sorry to the physical renderer first of all some um, words on my layout. I changed it. I adjusted it to my needs. There are some plugins like the XFrog in integrated V-Ray, and I, you know, I got rid of this um, line of icons here. And you can see this that I have some different, a different set of windows. My viewport, my content browser, render settings, picture view, and in the render settings, which you can also achieve via pressing Command B or uh, Control B. Um, you can decide for another renderer, for example, the V-Ray bridge, Simon hardware, and so on. And of course, now we have this physical renderer. So I choose physical, and when you choose physical, you see the physical renderer's properties. Mostly in videos, um, they talk about the new depth of field and motion blur feature, which makes it possible to connect motion blur and depth of field to certain parameters of your camera. But I'm not talking about this at all now, I'm just talking about render quality and render speed. So there is two, uh, no, three different types of sampling. So sampling, again, this is just a general set of parameters um, causing different types of quality for your rendering. And this is new, you didn't have this before. This is a an overall control about how good your rendered image looks and most of all you have to choose between the uh, specific render uh, sampling modes like adaptive, fixed and progressive. I'm really fond of progressive and I'm talking about this later on. But first of all let's see what all the other um, parameters do. We have six of them sampling subdivisions, shading subdivisions minimum, shading subdivisions maximum and blurriness, shadow and ambient occlusion subdivision maximum these um, values mm, are responsible for the quality of the sampling of certain effects like uh, global illumination, light and so on, and blurriness, shadow, uh, area shadows of course, and ambient occlusion. So when you want to have it really fast rendered, when you're in your testing phase and you need really, really fast renderings, just do as I do and put all those values to zero. Right? I'll show you later on this, that this is nothing of a problem at all. Just make sure that your renderings are really going fast. And there's a third item in this um, physical renderer properties, which is called indirect Ill illumination. And you might think you have to check this to have you know, global illumination, but you don't have to. This is just a, another way to have global illumination. This is um, of higher quality and it usually takes longer in rendering so you don't have to take this just keep it unchecked okay we'll have global illumination as we used to in the earlier days via this effect global illumination okay but first of all keep in mind those values are set to zero now we have this physical renderer engaged and we have those six values put to zero so once again let's have a rendering command r we had seven seconds for the standard rendering and we have some seconds more for the physical render, um, physical rendering. 
Okay, this doesn't bother us because we'll see that this will be no problem at all later on. Okay, so this is the physical renderer. This is all, um, nearly all, <laughs> I should say, that you have to set up in the physical renderer properties. Now, the second thing, which is really important, we need a light source. And for an exterior rendering, things have become very easy because we just can stick to the physical sky object and use it completely to lighten our scene. We don't need anything else for a daylight scene. Normally we don't have to just um, create a physical sky object. And normally you would do this via the create menu. You go to the physical sky, physical sky command. I have a button integrated in my interface which does the same. I just click it and here we are with a physical sky. <coughs> When you hit Command R for rendering, you will see that the scene will be lit by this physical sky. And as long as it's as it's rendering, I can talk about this a little bit. You should know, or um, might already know, that the physical renderer, uh, sorry, the physical sky, integrates two light sources, and this is a direct light source, accounting for the, you know, rather hard shadows and which uh, don't look very nice up to now but never mind and the other light source is the diffuse light um, accounting for the you know overall diffuse light reflected by the sky atmosphere so this is a diffuse light without shadows this is the second light source integrated in the into the physical sky so th this is rather useful so because you can you know have the uh, realistic looking light setup sunlight, direct sunlight, and diffuse skylight. Okay, this is what it looks like. And the first thing I would like to do is to change the light direction. And I'm not choosing coordinates to do this in the first place. I choose time and location. And of course, I don't really want to have a December light set up. Um, you know, it's December right now and it's snowing outside and it's really, really cold. I would really love to have something in May. And as you can, as you could see, the shadows look, look really awesome because, you know, the light is just coming from the south. Exactly, so this doesn't look very nice. I'm normally changing my time of day to something before noon. I can click inside this little watch and move the mouse down and let's say we take 10.30 or some time in the afternoon. So this is normally a better decision for really good looking light and really good looking shadows than taking the exact noon time. Okay, I render again just to check the shadow direction. You know, this is very crucial for a good image to have a really nice shadow graphics. And as I already know, this is rather nice because the shadow is coming, you know, it's coming towards me, it's showing in the foreground, so this is rather nice. Okay, so this is without, up to now, this is without global illumination, that means we've got only direct lighting. And of course we will want to change this, one B. And as I said, don't check this. In the first place, just stick to the traditional global illumination effect coming under the effects menu, global illumination. And just to remind you, there are some things to just keep in mind when you want fast renderings. And this is, um, first of all, that you put the density of the samples down to its very minimum. These are the stochastic samples and the record density. And these two values are very crucial. You can choose custom presets like low and preview. They look like really bad and really fast. And when you click on those small triangles, you can see what this means. Accuracy is 50%, okay, why not? And record density is minus two for the minimum rate and minus one for the maximum rate. This is the resolution the sampler takes when considering each pixel from the image. So I don't want to bother you with the details, but uh, I can tell you that the lower the values, the faster the rendering goes. And of course, the 
um, you know, the more artifacts and, and mistakes you have in your in your rendering. But then again, we want fast renderings, and I crank it down to the very minimum, which is minus eight, and I'm doing the same with the maximum rate. That means um, every pixel is, um, you know, taken care of with the same low amount of samples, regardless of its complexity in the scene. So let's have a look at the rendering, but first of all, uh, keep in mind we want diffuse depth not only one, which means there are more than one bounce of light. We want three bounces of light. So this is lightening up our scene again. We need reflections actually, so this is why we take global illumination, so it's no use just taking one light uh, bounce, but we actually want some more, like three. Okay, we stick to these values, they're just okay. Back to the viewport, let's have it rendered again. Remember there were 10 seconds for the um, non-global illumination picture. And of course, as you might expect, it takes a little bit longer to have it rendered with global illumination. Actually, I think it's 34 or 35 seconds. Let's see. The most difficult part is in the middle, the glass, the reflecting glass and transparency and stuff like that, so it's going faster outside, as you can see. And I would like to show you in the first place, just before you know, going on with fine-tuning the physical sky and stuff like that, I would like to show you, it's 42 seconds, I would like to show you how you can optimize render speed again, not um, tuning the render settings parameters, but doing something on the model itself. And as you can see here, there are some objects which are more detailed, like for example the secondary roof structure. You don't see it, actually. Uh, we can also switch it off, actually, but um, for some reasons I don't want to, and this is the grid inside. And as you might think too, there's no reason why those two elements should take part in the GI calculation with the same amount of exactness as the rest of the model. So what I would like to show you is that you just assign compositing tags to these two objects to be found under Cinema 4D compositing. And as you can see, these render tags or compositing tags allow for some adjustments. Like for example, you can turn off self-shadowing. That means they don't cast shadow on themselves, which is actually something I wouldn't ever see, so I just can switch it off. Later on, we don't want to have it affected by ambient occlusion. We didn't choose this effect yet, but later on we will, so there's no use that these very, you know, complex elements have ambient occlusion, so you can switch this off too. And then the most important thing, you can tune down or sample down GI quality, that is the amount of precision that these elements um, contribute to the scene. So what you can see here is the intensity ratio. I keep it uh, like, like this, 100%. This is the lightness that produce. But the stochastic samples ratio and the record density ratio, you can down from 100%. This is the render settings we did before in the render settings in the global illumination tab. Down from this 100%, I'm choosing, let's say, 10%. So only 10% precision are used when calculating the GI contribution of those elements. And as I know my model very good, there are some more items that may take use of this render tag. I just press Command or Control and drag it, this, compos this compositing tag, to the railing object and to some part of the facade, metal tool. So now four rather complex objects are only calculated 10% GI quality compared to the rest of the model. So let's, let's render again. This was 42 seconds. And let's see how fast it, it'll go now. It looks faster. But as you see, it doesn't mean a thing up to now. 
But keep this in mind, you can use the compositing tags very well to just, you know, treat objects individually as far as their accuracy in render calculation is concerned. Well, it looks like being pretty much faster. Well, it was 42 and now it's 37. Okay, this is at least five seconds faster. Okay, uh, um, keep it like that. Uh, we could do some more, you know, optimization inside the model, but uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to show you how this is basically done to just proceed with my initial subject using the physical sky and the physical renderer. Okay, so what's next? What is next is that I want to show you a very, very, very cool feature inside the render settings. And this is called progressive. You know, as I said before, the sampling is done adaptively at the moment. That is, more complex parts are being handled with a little bit more detail, a little bit more, little bit more calculation, and flatter parts are, you know, dealt with uh, in, in less precision. And what you can do now is to have progressive mode, and this means that a first pass is rendered, which is really primitive, using all those zero parameters. And then the renderer is refining the image over and over again with further passes. And when you click on this small triangle, you can see that there are several modes. You can have this done infinitely. That means as long as your file is open, the renderer is working on this image, putting passes over passes over passes and always ever refining your picture until it comes to a point where you would like to save it and show it to your client or some, some, someone else. Okay, So this is infinite. This is um, cho chosen by default. You can also <coughs> determine it like pass count. You can say after 10 passes I want to have it stopped. And you can also say like, you know, time limit, you have 6 hours left, perhaps you're sleeping going to bed and you know that after six hours you have to take this picture and show it to someone, you can um, write six hours in there and it's finishing rendering after six hours. Okay, but we'll stick to infinite and try it again. And now what you can see is building this um, after preparing the sky maps and the irradiance cache. It's doing the progressive pass one and as you might already um, think, it's going faster. We had 37 seconds earlier on with the adaptive mode, and now it's doing in progressive mode. And it's normally very fast, and as you can see, it's really noisy, and it's not really up for a final presentation. Okay, it was uh, also 37 seconds, and now it's calculating the image over and over again. It's progressive pass 2 and so on. So he's never stopping this unless you do something. You know, we are in the viewport, and uh, the rendering in the viewport always stops when we do something else. We click, for example, inside the object manager, and here we are. It's being stopped. Okie doke. So now, let's start rendering in the picture viewer, because there we can compare images. So when we change any parameters, we can control the effects and compare it to previous pictures and so on. First of all, Command-B shows me how big my renderings will be. As you can see, it's 800 by 600, and as you might know, rendering is calculating pixels, and the less lesser pixels we have, the faster the rendering will go. So we stick to some lower values like 640 by 480 and then we have rendered it in the picture viewer shift r i'm switching my side panel off and have it fit to screen Render times may differ a little bit because my editor is surely not 640 by 480. So of course, when you, you know, when you really need your renderings being fast, oh, this is only 24 seconds. You can, uh, you can always reduce the picture size because the light amount and the texture effects and 
all this stuff that is so important to you will be visible also in smaller images. Okay, he's rendering passes and passes and passes and now that I'm in the picture viewer I can do some different things without stopping the renderer. This is quite good too. And what I would like to do now is first of all lightening up the scene a little bit. As you can see the foreground is correct. It's light enough, it's bright enough, I'm sorry, and you wouldn't do something about the foreground because it really looks good. But again the roof is very dark, so we need to you know, lighten up the dark parts of the image. And therefore we choose in the render settings a, an old effect. This is not new, this is not new, no new feature of uh, R13, and it's called color mapping. Color mapping is a very powerful tool to correct your light um, in your scene, in your image, and basically it's rather simple. You have exponential and HSV model checked and just leave it like that. The dark multiplier lightens up the dark parts, the bright multiplier darkens the bright parts, so when you enhance those values like 1.5, the dark parts will be lit, brightened up, and as we don't need to <coughs> darken the bright parts, we just keep it like that. Let's try. He's still calculating, so when I hit Shift R, he's asking me if he can, you know, abort it and render a new image. And of course, this is what he should do. And now I would like to compare those images. You know, this is the new one, which is actually being calculated. This is the older one. And you can see that it, there's a difference. The sky has become a little bit too bright. No, actually it didn't. I don't know what, what happened with the sky, but I will scroll into it and you see it's um, the sky is a little bit darker, which is nice, and the foreground metal parts are lighter. You can see it especially at this column. Actually you don't see any details in the column here, but in the new rendering you'll see, you see it. Okay, so this is quite nice. And keep this in mind, color mapping. Okay. So again, he's calculating and calculating and calculating, and I can do something without having him stopped. And now let's turn to the physical sky itself. As I told you, the physical sky contains of two light sources, basically, and this is the diffuse light, sky, and the direct light, the sun. These two tabs are responsible for the amount of direct lighting and indirect lighting. Indirect not in the sense of global illumination, but indirect in the sense of that it's diffuse, that's, that it's got no specific direction and that it doesn't cast any shadow. Okay, so what you can do is to um, change the relation between the two light sources. Now we have 100% intensity of the sky and 100% intensity of the uh, sunlight, the direct light. And whatever you like, if you want to soften the shadows and sample the sunlight effect down a little bit and, you know, um, turn the uh, sky intensity up, you just do um, like this. You um, turn down the intensity value, let's say, to 50% in the sun tab, and in the sky tab you enhance it to 150. So altogether we need 200 more or less, so you have to, you know, compensate it. Sky 150, Sun 50. And then there is some other important thing. I would like to have it a little bit, a little, I'm sorry, a little bit less bluish. The bluish tint is, you know, it's typical for noontime, but I would like to make use of some warmer colors and Cinema 4D allows for that. You just check, use warm colors, use chroma color map. And to see the difference, we should change the viewport. I'll switch it off again, and you can see this is rather blue and light and stuff like that. And when you check, use warm colors, it's changing. And when you check, use chroma color map again, 
This is meant to cool down the picture to give it some blue again, but it can add to this use warm colors. You see, this is what it does when it's checked alone. This was previous, this was chroma color map, and this is together with use warm colors. This looks rather nice, actually. Let's see how this works, and you can do the same with the sun, use warm colors. Okay, so when we hit Shift R again, the picture viewer will render a new image. Yes, you may. Just waiting for some seconds, and now we can compare it. You see the difference already. This is a difference, actually. Maybe a little bit too strong, but uh, just to show you, yeah? just to make you see that this is a difference. Perhaps we could reduce the color mapping from 1.5 to 1.3. I would, I'm getting impatient. I would like to, you know, it's always like that. You're reducing something like point two down or up and check it. some option here and uncheck an option there and it's always playing around with with little small nearly hidden checkboxes stuff like that okay this is turning into a rather nice picture and now let's go on with the physical sky the physical sky as i said is um, based on two light sources but there are more features you can have. For example, basic under the basic tab you can check clouds. And again I will switch to the viewport because it's updated in the viewport when I check clouds. And boom there are clouds. Okay, so do you like those clouds? Yes or no? So if you don't like those clouds you can go to the clouds tab and de-check the uh, cloud layers just consider this like, like a Photoshop feature. You know, the clouds actually are noises. And noises, you know, are something like Photoshop filters, and they are stacked on layers, and you can check them or uncheck them, thus adding cloud layers onto each other. As a matter of fact, I would like to stick to layer 1 and layer 5. If you ever want to edit those layers, you see that they are noises and you can choose different noises and have different images of clouds as you can see. So what was this anarchy? <laughs> I have to turn back to my... Okay. And as you can see you can do a lot of things, really a lot of things to adjust your layers, your cloud layers. And it's beautiful, it's just, you know, it's shaders and you can fiddle around with the shader properties and have different clouds all over the place. So, as I said, I decide for layer 1 and layer 5. Okay, these are my clouds. This is one thing, I have it shift R again, you know, having it rendered in the picture view. Looking at my, at my former images. So this is what I like about the picture view, you just can compare what you have done so far. This was the initial view, color mapping, this was warm colors and changing the relation between diffuse and direct light. This was color mapping darkened down a little bit, which was not so good actually. So as you can see you have a nice control over what you've done so far. And here you see your rendering together with the clouds. It's quite nice, isn't it? And again, there's something we can do. We can go to the physical sky again, clouds tab. No, not the clouds tab, to the details tab. And there are some options you can turn on and off, like show moon, show stars, show, show planets. This is, of course, for night views. Sky dome light, sky dome light switched off. And here we have this option generate GI, which we make use of already. 
though we didn't know of this, the strength and saturation, you can sample it down the, uh, the skylight, you can even sample down the saturation, that means the amount of color it's generating, and here we see cloud influence, and as you can see the clouds are colored, so it might be a good idea to have the clouds contributing to the color scheme of the image. Like for example in the foreground we have this granite platform and it's rather gray blue with a blue tint and the colored um, clouds don't seem to take part in, in coloring this platform. So what you can do, you can crank up the value to, for example, 100%. And this is what you normally would like to have because when you, for example, use HDR eye lighting, you normally do this because you want to have the colors from the HDR image contributing to the color scheme of your image. Because normally light is not purely white, it's colored because it's reflected by colored you know, surfaces. So there's never, nearly never, a pure white light scheme. For example, when you have a, have a white facade and it's it's covered, it's surrounded by trees. Trees are contributing um, green light to the scene, so they're greening up the, the white facade. So this is what you normally want when you use image-based lighting, and of course we want to use it here too. So cloud influence putting up, uh, put it up, uh, put up to sorry to 100% means that now the granite platform will look much different. Not much, but considerably. <coughs> I'm sorry. Okie doke. Okay, now we're coming near, and you won't realize it perhaps when you see only this new image, but when you compare it... Okay, let's full screen. And compare it like just... You see the difference, okay? This just fits better into the color scheme of the sky. It's more organic, and of course, then also it's more realistic. By the way, you know this HB comparison, do you? I think I don't have to tell you, but you can click on this rendering and hit A, and when you click on this and hit B, you can have a comparison between those two images, and you can change vertical horizontal, and you can see the difference right away, which is very cool. Okay, so. No, no comparison anymore. Really full screen. Put it back to fit the screen. Okay. So we saw quite a lot of things now, and I think that you've seen already the most important things. So I could stop now, but there are some things. I would like to show you some details. First of all, you can save the settings you made for your physical sky. Because, as you might know, from in the basic tab you can load sky presets. And when you do this, you can just, you know, choose a set that you like, and then everything is gone. If you close this file and open it again, you'll never come back to your sky settings you've made unless you save them. So let's press Command Z, Control Z, <coughs> turn back to our settings, and what you can do, there's no save presets command inside the attribute manager, but you can use the objects manager for this. The physical sky has a lot of sets that have been changed. When you press File and choose Save Object Preset, you can save this, give it a proper name, like for example, May one cloud. Okay, this preset is saved. And just to show you what this means, I'm opening up a new scene. 
change to my content browser and now you can choose um, I'm sorry you can search for your personal preset you just saved it's stored under presets and there's a folder called user and as you can see there are some different folders in my situation and you can see that here is uh, you can find May Warm Cloud. This is your preset you saved. I saved some presets before. And when you click this, double click this, it's coming into your scene. You see? So when I switch to the viewport, you see that now your physical sky with all those time and location settings, May 1030, sky 150, use more colors, etc. etc. 50% for the for the sun, and we have got cloud layer one and, and five and basic we have clouds checked and in details we have cloud influence 100% so you can see that you can share, save your sky presets just like that file save preset and it's stored in your content browser don't forget about your content browser it's a really useful feature so this is one thing Oops. let's change to the scene again and this is just another scene this is one thing you can store your physical sky settings. Another thing is I already showed you how you can reduce render quality for certain objects like for example for certain parts of the roof <coughs> you can sample down the um, GI calculation for certain objects like I did here you can forbid self-shadowing you can um, decide for no ambient occlusion for these objects oh, um, as I see now, we forgot ambient occlusion. No problem, we'll do this later on. But even if you have ambient occlusion as a fact, you can uh, exclude objects from using this. So this is rather handy. Okay? And then some more stuff. We <coughs> the general amount of light is coming from the physical sky. And together with the camera settings, I forgot to talk about them actually, on the physical you see f-stop, ISO and shutter speed. These are new features coming with R13. You can handle your camera like a real camera. So you can choose for some rather sound parameters for f-stop, ISO and shutter speed to um, influence how your scene is lit. Okay, so this is rather simple stuff, I think, and this is only possible when using the physical render, actually. And the other thing is, you can change the light scene, the light set, not only by the physical sky settings and the camera settings, but also by the material settings. And let's look, for example, at the granite material from uh, used for the platform. I double-click it. And as you can see, there is uh, the basic material channels like color, diffusion and bump, but also there's always illumination. And this is for how this material behaves inside this GI calculation. And in this case, there's generate GI and receive GI. And for generate GI, the strength has been enhanced to 200%. That means that the granite texture is producing double as much um, light especially for the roof, um, that it would do normally. Okay, You can also sample down saturation so that the reflected, reflected light isn't that colorful. This is not, a, uh, not much of a problem in this case, but imagine this would be a lawn or, or meadow or something that would be green and it would, you know, uh, turn this whole roof into some green thing. So you, can, you could turn down the saturation for, for the green platform. Would it be green? And then again, you can also change the amount of GI received, that means light received from GI calculation. If you think something is too bright or too dark, you can fiddle around with those values again. Okay, this is all I wanted to show you on the material settings side. So one last thing, as I said, I forgot about the ambient occlusion. I'm going back to the picture view. You see it looks rather nice. No, oh, this one looks rather nice, this doesn't look rather nice, this one looks rather nice because it's matching the more colorful, warm colors of the, of the sky. I mean, occlusion is um, checked in the render settings, it's just another effect, ambient occlusion. 
apply to project. I don't change some uh, anything here. And as you can see in the physical renderer, and as you've seen as you've seen before, there is a value for ambient occlusion sampling. This is set to zero. That means <coughs> the subdivision is rather low. You can't have a lower value like zero. So this ambient occlusion, which normally takes quite a lot of time while rendering, is done very fast in the first pass. So this is just what we wanted. I'm just you know starting it again. And now we have some ambient occlusion. Okay, this was mainly all on the physical renderer. I wanted to show you how it works together with the physical sky and especially how the progressive mode works. And again, you always have to make sure that your render times are as low as possible. And I think it's quite easy now to control all these parameters. So one last word on the progressive rendering. It is rendering all the time. It's putting pass upon pass and it's getting a producing a refined image over all those minutes and hours and days. And it doesn't stop unless you make it stop. There's a command file stop rendering, otherwise it won't ever stop. And but what you can do, um, let's say you have to you need some preview image to just put it somewhere and show it to someone. You can just save it. Save as. You choose a format like Photoshop and you know the image depth. Um, in case you have some multi-pass rendering, you can choose for layers and so on. <coughs> and you click OK, you can save it somewhere and the rendering still proceeds. That is, you can save pictures out of your rendering process and it doesn't stop, it's just going on. Okay, so I hope you liked this video. I hope you learned something about using the physical renderer. I hope you don't mind that there are some, that this is adding tutorial material to already existing video tutorials, but I think this is quite nice for architectural visualization. See how you can handle this physical renderer for your architectural rendering demands. Thank you very much, have a nice time, and see you next.